virtual event celebrating the debut novel by Catherine Adele West, um, Saving Ruby King. And we are so uh, thrilled also to be welcoming back, um, at least virtually, Lisa Cross Smith. She's been at City Lit, um, and she will be in conversation with Catherine. And her latest book is So We Can Glow. Um, Catherine Adele West is an editor living and working in Chicago. She graduated with both her bachelor's and master's of science in journalism from the University of Illinois, Urbana. Her work is published in Black Box, 521, Better Than Starbucks, Doors Ajar, The Helix Magazine, and Game Magazine. Saving Ruby King is her first novel. Lisa is a homemaker and the author of So We Can Glow, Whiskey, Whiskey and Ribbons, Every Kiss of War, and the forthcoming This Close to OK. She lives in Kentucky. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome both of you to City Lit Books. Thank you so much for having me, Teresa. I really, really appreciate you you hosting uh, City Lit Books. Just chef's kiss. So I appreciate it. <laughs> We're thrilled too. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Same, exact same. <laughs> yeah, so um, hi, Kathy. <laughs> hi, Lisa. How you doing, girl? <laughs> I'm good. Girl, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing wonderful. You know, I, I might... really wanted to start. <laughs> no, I just really want to say we're kind of wearing the same type of glasses. I don't know what this is, but you know, <laughs> it means we're smart. It does mean we're smart yeah. that we're connected on a level that only black women we just <laughs> we have a level that we're connected on. We do it. <laughs> I wanted to start by reading, so I blurbed this book, um, and you know, so that means that I got to read it early and got to um, get to read it early and to write um, early in advance what what I what I thought about it, the feelings I got from it, and I just devoured it and I just adored it. So I wanted to start by reading the blurb. Um, this is what I felt when I read your book for the first time. Are you ready? Okay, you read it. I read it so many times. I love it. <laughs> I wrote. Told with teeth and tenderness, Saving Ruby King is a surprising, pedal-down debut that explores what happens when the fabrics of family, faith, and friendship snag on violent machinations of the heart. Redemption and survival share a pew with reckoning and hope here, all tangled up with the ties that bind. Catherine Adele West gifts us Chicago, Chicago, the Black Church, and a choir of flawed, wonderfully complicated characters who flash fresh with every turn of the page, who stand against the wind, who won't go down without a fight. And I mean that, <laughs> no. you know, specifically, yeah. Yeah, and, and I appreciate it. Just so you know, I've read it so many times, I was kind of mouthing along with you when you were reading the blurb, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Cause it's like you, you're just, you're just like the violent machinations of the heart, told with teeth and tenderness. I remember the first time I read that blurb, I said, oh, so it's good. <laughs> Well, let me tell you what I do when I'm, so when I'm blurbing, I take the book and as I'm reading it, I constantly make notes on my phone. So as I'm reading it, I'll get three, four chapters in and I'll get this idea, some, some sort of rhythm, something that keeps coming back to me and back to me. And especially with this, I just kept thinking teeth and tenderness. Cause it was like on every page, I'd be like, Oh, you know, something horrible is happening. Something really heavy is happening. But then I also feel like the way you love your characters, um, even the ones that aren't so great, even the ones who aren't so great, it's still this tenderness that you treat, um, you treat them with. And I, it just jumped out, you know, it just jumped out in the violent part. I mean, there is a lot of violence. <laughs> I mean, there's violence in the book, you know, but then, you know, what happens when love and faith sort of get snagged on that, when you're thrown, thrown into a situation you weren't expecting and the way you've handled it is just amazing. You know that. Okay. Um, I want to start by asking you um, how your debut year is going so far. So it started under these funky circumstances, of course, but so far as having your debut come out, um, I don't know. How are you feeling? Is it what you thought it was going to be or? Honestly, it's, how can I say this? It isn't at all what I pictured, partly because of the pandemic, yeah. but mostly because I didn't know. It's my debut novel, so it's like it's like the first book that I have coming out. I didn't know <laughs> right. the processes. I'm like, I don't know. What a line edits. What's the difference between a de developmental? Yeah. I don't know. I'll just do what you're telling me to do when I write this. But I mean, I've learned <laughs> yeah, so right, much. Right, yeah. Like, I've learned so much and I've gained so many new friends new cohorts Absolutely. um 
and and the support has just coming out has, has come out of really surprising places like when i got now mind you i read with whiskey and ribbons okay so when i read it i was just like i threw the book across the room like i ain't never writing like that whatever you know what i mean i was just like i'm like i'm just i'm gonna just i should just pack it up i should pack this up I please know. i don't even know no, I mean, like there, there was times I was like reading the book and tearing up a little bit. I ain't going, you know, but allergies, you know, allergies. But getting Please. back, <laughs> but getting, but getting back to the, getting back to the question, it's, it's been like, like you said, started off, uh, you know, funky, but like right. I've had so many great opportunities come out of this, and I've been able to reach a heck of a lot more people than I would have been able to reach on you know a book tour just kind of going you know in and around illinois or possibly going to the state or going to that state like right i've met right. so many people and and so many have have reached out to me and just said hey i read your book and i loved your book and and i want to see what's coming out next and it's also taught me how to prioritize and deal with things that just really aren't that important like you think something is important it's it's not you know what i mean like does it suck to be kind <laughs> right. of stuck in your house during your debut year, yeah, it, it does. But there were so many other things that could be going on. And I'm just sitting up here like, I wrote and completed a book. Not only did I write and complete a book, I got Absolutely. an agent and then took the book, the first book I ever wrote, and then it got sold. Now, if I sit up here and complain, it's <laughs> like, oh, my tiara's cricket. It has five diamonds. <laughs> instead of the seven i wanted like that's just that's a trash take so my debut year has been so it's it's been fun it's it's been wonderful and i've gotten to meet so many people like yourself and i just i i, I don't well, and it's only just I begun yeah. i mean yeah you know and, and i mean like yeah I said, and it's, like, and it's I, only it was, just begun yeah <laughs> Okay, well, since you started talking about, um, you know, you writing it and looking for an agent and all that, I do want to hear about the process of writing it. And, and, you know, apologies if you're tired of talking about it, but just in general terms, sort of like how long did it take you? And, you know, did it take you a long time to find an agent? Was it a frustrating experience? Was it all like smooth sailing for you? How was that? Oh, smooth, smooth sailing. Okay. So what had happened was... <laughs> Um, and, and, and yes, I, I get asked this question, but I, I don't mind talking about it because you never know who you're going to reach. There might, might be somebody who right. doesn't, you know, know the story and I can give them a little bit of information. So it took me five years to write Singing the King on and off because I have a full-time job as an editor. And there's nothing like having to read people's stuff and then be like, okay, after eight hours of reading everybody's stuff, now I got to work on my own stuff. And then not knowing what I'm doing. Right, right. I mean, like I said, it's the first book I wrote because a friend of mine, I was writing short stories up, up until that time. And a, a, a college buddy of mine, I'm telling her the, the idea for the short story. She's like, you should write a book. And my dumb butt, because I got a, a couple of degrees in journalism, is like, I sure can write a book. That's not hard. That's not hard to write. It, it was hard as hell. <laughs> I think... Um, <laughs> Like, like maybe, you know, after I give birth and I can be like, yeah, that was the hardest thing. Like right now, this book was like literally the hardest thing I've ever had to, to do. And part of it was like fear that kind of, you know, what would hold me back. Because like I said, like I would read other people's books. I would read stuff, you know, I would read your book and just be like, I'm not going to, this isn't, I'm not good enough. You know, you know what I mean? And, and that can kind of creatively constipate you. Um, I'm, I should see them that creatively constipate. I also love alliteration. Uh, so, so it took me five years to, to write the book, right? So mind you, I decided for my first book to write a multi-POV, non-linear narrative. Because what the hell? <laughs> and then I finished it and I started in 2012 and I finished the rough draft in 2017. And I think I made the mistake all new new writers tend to make even though i had been at it for five years like I'm, i was still new to the to the process and i'm thinking okay it's done now it's ready mm -hmm. to query like nah boo boo mm -mm. sure yeah you know what i mean sure. I'm like I, <laughs> I i wrote the end right it's let me query this so it took me nine months to find an agent and and 
I know in the wow. of things, that's not super long, but to me, it felt like nine years. Because, you know, sometimes you'll come really, really close. Oh, sure, sure. You know what I mean? And you're thinking like, this is it, and it's not it, and then you're like devastated. You know what I mean? It's literally a roller coaster of emotion. Then comes the thing oh, about yeah. being a black rock. Oh, yeah. So then you get there, and I know you've gotten this. I can't really identify with the voice. Yeah, because oh, yeah. written by a black woman. It's not for you. It's literally a different, like if you get out of the white gaze and kind of, right. you know, so I, I would run into a lot of that. But I would run into some constructive criticism. One agent said, hey, look, I love this about your book. This is what you need to work on. And I got uh, what's called a revise and resubmit. You know what that is. So basically right, when, right. when an agent says your book is good, but it's just not that ready. But if you work on these things, send it back to me. I'll see if I want to take you on. Essentially, that's what a, a revise and resubmit mm-hmm. is. So I did the revise and resubmit. It took me five months. And I literally decimated half of the book and rewrote it. Wow. And mind you, the book had an additional POV and an additional timeline. And I had to, and I got rid of that. And then, re, you know, rebuilt it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, because Holden okay. was his own POV and he had his own timeline. Got rid of that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Because it really got into like the whole Chicago police brutality thing. But, you know, I, I didn't, you know, uh, you know, so, so I took uh, that out. And then. Yeah, which you uh, could write an entire book about. I literally could just write a book about Holden and the stuff that he went through. In the stuff. Yeah. And honestly, that's a good idea. not even playing with you oh my goodness <laughs> um so uh where was it so i uh finished the revising recently it took me five months right so from mm-hmm. january to may um no from january to april excuse me so like about four months and then we did dv pit and i'm sure you've heard of it it's the the pitch contest mm-hmm. started by best failing mm-hmm. so then i repitched uh this said you know repitched the book of dv pit um, one of the likes I got was from my agent, Beth Marche. I sent her the book. Um, got some interest from some other agents, and uh, and and I chose Beth. And then we worked on an additional round of edits. It took me a few months. And in November of 2018, we Beth and I got together like in July of 2018. November of 2018, we finished the last edits. We went on sub. January 16th, 2019 is when she called me and told me. Colin uh, was gonna oh, wow. save me Ruby King. Yeah, so I was on I was on sub for only six weeks. Once again, my tiara is crooked. And oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> that's it, a, it, yeah, that's amazing. I, and, and I was I was extremely pleased about that because <laughs> because I didn't really know what to do. What's on sub? How does that work? How long are people on sub? I didn't know six weeks was a short time. I thought six weeks was like oh lord. Yeah. Jesus. How am I getting ready to, you know what yeah. I mean? So it, it was just, it was a, it was a long story, but a really quick process for me. But once I knew yeah. what I was doing, it would, you know, it, it helped. Okay. So, so what about the initial seed of the story? Was that something you had had in your mind from before? Or you just knew you wanted to write a book and that was the first, like this story came to you like easily or... No, I actually, (laughs) this story or the seed of the story, again, it was just going to be like a short story, right? And uh, it was really just a way to kind of understand the relationship I had with my dad. You don't see a lot of books or stories with about like black father-daughter relationships, right? By the way, shout out to Matthew Cherry, Hair Love. Mm -hmm. I watch it all the Mm -hmm. time. (laughs) Lord Jesus. I always get a tear. Once again, allergies. Um, But you don't really get a chance to see a lot of books about black father daughter relationships and I wanted to write a book about right. it. Saving Ruby King was right. originally called Potter's Wheel because it was just going to be based oh, okay. on Lay- it was originally just going to be Layla and Jackson but then it's like okay. you can write about that but you need something more to kind of butt up against so then I created Lebanon kind of as a foil mm-hmm. and then I felt like Layla needed a similar aged cohort so I created Ruby but her name was originally Louise. 
my agent had me change it because I would have had a book with five or six main characters and three of them. All those L's. Yeah. <laughs> and I didn't, once again, rookie mistake. I didn't know. So I uh, changed Louise to Ruby. And then my, uh, my editor, Laura Brown, was the one who changed the title from Potter's Wheel to Saving Ruby King, one of the best decisions I ever made. Yeah. Uh, I was just like, Laura? Because uh, at first, you know, I, I was a little butthurt about it. I was like, but Potter's Wheel was, that's just a great title. And then and Laura is just fantastic. She's like, no, I understand what you're trying to do with the mm. title. Great. But little cerebral. And I, you know, so these are some, some options. And Saving Ruby King just, popped out and that's what you chose and so happy I wasn't that. Well, that's the blessing of having both an editor and an agent. They're just in such a different, they handle such a different aspect of publishing. They can see the stuff that's popping off. They can see the titles that are popping off. They see things and they're so good at their jobs. And when you make such a good match like that, it's like, they, um, especially, you know, speaking for myself, my agent and editor, like, see things I don't see. It's not even my job to see. My job is to write my books, write the best books I can, and then they can come back to me and be like, this is what's right happening right now, because books. they're like, and, and, and <clears throat> you're so kind. Thank you so much. But you, you were talking about specifically just being able to, you, you know, when you, you, you don't know what's going on in this biz and when you're brand new and you sort of learn and you learn so much and I learn so much all the time. But one of the things I learned that's most important to me when, since I've been in this business for a little bit now is to let people do their jobs. And so work with people who you can trust and let them do their job. Like I've, I've publicist, my publicist, it's her job to handle some things and marketing people. It's there. You can, you literally can't do it all anyway. And you should be working on a team where you trust the people. And so if she comes back to you and is like, trust me in this title, you know, and it doesn't, you know, even if you had a hard time with it, as long as it doesn't completely change your vision for it or something right. like that, you can get it. And Stephen Ruby King is a great, it's such a great title because it has that element of mystery. And I was going to talk to you about that later anyway. But since you, um, since you already brought up all the multiple POVs, and then also, um, um, I was going to ask you about the just the different timelines we have different points of view and also your choice of running in present tense which i love present tense but yeah you were doing a lot there did that and did that scare you at first so are you like did that stress you out initially when you realized what you had gotten yourself into <laughs> when you do it so beautifully but it's kind of stress it stresses me out to think <laughs> to think about it it's like did you have one of those chart like did you have one of those charts on your wall with like the strings connected so you can so figure like it all Charlie out Day and I'm like this is a yeah. uh no I, <laughs> honestly I'm not kidding I pantsed it I'm not worth it I I'm an organized person in some respects so if you want to go like on this international journey with me that's when I become like Charlie Day and I have like strings about what we're going to do when it comes to my writing I need to yeah. be super organic with it and the thing is I didn't know to be stressed I didn't know to be fearful necessarily in terms of what I wanted to write in terms of me being a writer, yeah, you know what I mean? Because I, I you know, when, when you're trying to be a writer, you're trying to like figure out what your voice is. And honestly, and I know I'm not supposed to say this, that's why I stopped reading when I was writing. Because the problem was when I would read, when I was writing, I would get this insecure, like, why am I doing this? Like, I'm not going to match this person's like uh, craft, like their level. Like, I'm not going to hit that level. Like, I literally stopped reading Toni Morrison until after, like when, when I was done with a book, mm. I was like, okay, let me, let me read some Miss Toni. Cause if I try to read that one, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to ask you about that later. Yeah. yeah. Like that's canon right there. Like she's canon right there. Like what am I supposed to do with that? Right. So I literally stopped, <laughs> I stopped reading when I was writing, but honestly, Lisa, I didn't know to be scared. I didn't think that I was doing anything different. I wrote in present tense because my mom is a reading and English literature teacher. She was, she's retired. Like, I was always taught to write in present tense. Journalism, you got to write in present tense. You don't mm -hmm. write in present tense. Mm -hmm. So that's just something that I, that's just, I'm naturally trained to do. The multi-POV thing, I thought that I was a genius with that, right? Yes, you can decide to start writing. I agree, I agree. Uh, so 12 Trabs of Hattie came out. 
<laughs> and I remember I was sitting, I was sitting in my living room like, right, you can't see my couch, but I was sitting on this couch and I was looking at my dad like, I ain't gonna want this. Somebody already <laughs> get multi POV. What am I supposed to do now, Pop? And he's like, Catherine, just write your book and just you never know what's gonna happen. And so yeah, then I'm yeah. like, I'm like, all right. So then like I just wrote the book and played with timelines because like Quantum Leap is one of my favorite shows ever. <laughs> and so I just yeah yeah like, okay why not play with you know timelines and then like that means I had to do a little bit of like investigative or not investigative journalism but just like I had to interview a couple of people because like I was born in 1980 I don't know what it was like in the 60s so I was like talking to people at church yeah. I was talking to my parents I was talking to people in the neighborhood I was like so like what was y'all doing like 12 years or 17 years before I was born because I don't know what was going on <laughs> um and so like I got like all of this awesome feedback and then was able to kind of imbue it into this book and imbue it into these characters and then like I was reading a couple of books on and off one of them was the warmth of other sons it really really um informed how I wrote about especially African Americans in the past like the different like church themes from the 1960s that I was writing about um when I was talking mm -hmm. about the great migration and parts like a lot of that was informed by me reading the warmth of other sons by Isabel Wilkinson so you know I just I did my research and I just wrote what I wrote I didn't know anything would come of it I didn't think I'd be sitting here talking to you I tell you that much so <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just happy that you know that I just decided to to write what felt natural to me because I think that's the only way. Yeah, can and we it. all are. We're all blessed. And, you know, you have, you know, your readers, the readers are blessed. And, you know, and far as far as the canon goes, the canon is blessed by your work. So I'm glad, I'm so glad that you did. Oh, you're, um, I, let I me ask too. you, um, as, <laughs> I'm let me ask you about book. the multiple, <laughs> about the multiple p um, points of view. So originally had you always, um, um, had you always decided to include the church as that, which is really unique, really, really unique. And I think, I, I think especially because it gives us, um, it, it gives us such a unique point of view that you couldn't really get. I mean, you could in a third person omniscient sort of way, but, but I just think it's so cool how you did that. Was that always, did you know you were going to do that from jump? Like actually make the, cause it was, a, it, it was such a surprise to me when I was reading and I was like, whoa, that's really cool. Thank you. Um, no, <laughs> what happened was once again, first book, you know what the hell I was doing, right? <laughs> So at first the book was like all third person omniscient writing. I got so tired of it. And I'm like, I can't write like this. Like I need to write in first person. Mm -hmm. So then it was first person writing, but then I'm like, I keep feeling like I'm, I'm kind of changing the tone. So then I did multi POV cause that felt more natural. And then I could play with tone and yeah. character arc and, and dialogue and all of that. Then I uh, had like an early version of it. And that I let a coworker of mine, Luke Salazar, read. And this was like early version, like 2014-ish or something like that. And he read it, or, or like a portion of it, because I had like 40, 50 pages written. He was like, it's good, but you know what we get ideas if you made the church a character. That was his idea. Yeah? Yeah. What wasn't my idea. It was his idea. And then I was like, oh my God, this looks so fucking smart, bro. Oh my God. So yeah, I I was like, so I added that perspective and also it allowed me to scratch this literary itch. Like I love writing in a timeless classical way. So like Dickens mm -hmm. and Wilde and Shakespeare, right? But then I get to mix in my like Octavia Butler and my Baldwin and my Morrison. Yeah. And you know, so then I can kind of like play along with a lot of the 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 voice of the church. And that was like the one of the most fun characters I think besides Lebanon for me to write was the church well and it's funny because when I hear you saying that it makes and it, it leads perfectly into the next thing I want to ask because it it's like um the church has its voice and then Chicago has its voice and so what your friend was feeling is that the church was a character of its own anyway so might as well give it a voice and that's it's the same way I feel about Chicago having such you know a voice and you know in, in a way although it doesn't actually literally but it is almost like a character so I wanted to um specifically ask you about um 
Chicago. Like, tell me about your Chicago. So you're born and raised there. And I know that Morgan Parker, a while, a couple of years ago, but I feel like Chance the Rapper ended up retweeting it because she said, I wish I loved anything as much as people from Chicago love being from Chicago. <laughs> Right? And like I, we ride or die. We ride or die for our city. And Easy I tell you way. what, I have I have a couple of close writer friends from Chicago. And then the first thing I tell you about them is that they love being from Chicago. They love Chicago. Chicago is their favorite thing in the world. So tell me about your Chicago. So uh Lisa, you hit the nail on the head. So my Chicago, <laughs> my Chicago is it's fun and it's it's vibrant and it it can be tragic right but there's so much love here and there's hope and and there are people who get in your business but they mean well <laughs> and and you have church <laughs> where people get in your business but they mean well because they love you and you have <laughs> food and we have deep dish pizza and we are not messing with New York pizza and we literally <laughs> like you know we will go to bed for our pizza you see me fixing my hair like I dare y'all to say something about Chicago pizza like we don't play you know and <laughs> and and there's so many things I love about my city but things I need to change because it's it's segregated it's, it's like you know I wasn't I wasn't playing around when I said like south and west sides of black North is white, north of Ashland is Pilsen, and you have the Latinos, Asians are in Cermak, Chinatown. My city needs to, to be more integrated and diverse, and you know, we, we need to get some investment and in, in, in disinvest in marginalized communities, you know what I mean? It's just, it's this really crazy dichotomy of, of, of things that just, should clash but somehow they nailed and it, there's literally like no place like i'd rather be like the culture i mean you can have you know you can go and have a, a great time downtown and see a theater play and then go up to 87th street and get a 42 inch screen tv for like 50 dollars without a box and you know what's so much, <laughs> but it's a 50 dollar tv so what you getting ready to do now say something <laughs> but i love my city i read my city i die for my city yeah, can you even imagine trying to tackle Saving Ruby King and sending it somewhere else? No, not really. Um, there are some <laughs> cities, like there are cities that I love, right? Yeah. So, um, I love California, Los Angeles. Like, um, I want to get a house out there, but just you know, between the earthquakes, the mudslides, and the and everything else, I'm like. Oh, I can't, I can't get no insurance out there, but, but <laughs> no, I love y'all LA, but like, I love LA, right? But see, I wasn't born and raised in LA, so Me I don't like the ins and outs of LA, like I know the ins and outs of Chicago, you know what I mean? Love yeah, yeah. Honolulu, right? But I don't know the ins and outs of Honolulu, like that, you yeah. know, I love Paris, I love, what? I don't know, it's not Me in too. my my bone and marrow, you know what I mean? Like your hometown, that's in your blood and marrow. Like you can talk about that like nobody else, right? But yeah, it's just, it's, it's just gotta be in you. I, I couldn't see putting Saving Ruby King at any other city. Now my other books <clears throat> take place in different cities, but best believe these yeah. are cities that I've read upon, did my research on, you know what I mean? And, and want to do yeah. extreme justice to, but there's just like, but there's no place else like Chicago. So, I mean, there there could have been no Saving Ruby King without Chicago in it. Just, there couldn't have been. Yeah. Yeah, I like that, though. That's that's beautiful. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Um, yeah, okay. I wanted to ask you the easiest thing about writing this book. Can you tell me that? What was the easiest thing to get done when you were working on this? <laughs> um really or was I, there was there <laughs> was there something easy I yeah <laughs> um really I'm, I'm not playing the easiest the easiest thing like i said um the easiest thing really was writing the calvary chapter the calvary chapters were the easiest part okay. for me to write because i needed a way to give background like really you know info dump but without looking like you're info dumping so I already right, the right. backstories about like a lot of the characters and I already love to talk in this really classic lyrical way. So I could bang out a whole Calvary chapter 
in a couple of hours with very yeah. little editing he did because it was just like ooh, classical yes i get wow. to speak in this like yeah, yeah. yeah so calvary was super easy for me to do okay so what was the hardest the hardest thing about writing the book writing ruby writing her <laughs> okay. she was the hardest yeah yeah you know because ruby has to kind of there's there's just kind of this melancholy-ish way about mm -hmm. ruby there's a sad way of ruby that i had to learn how to write without feeling hopeless without feeling like somebody's like i'm just going to take a bunch of pills because if i have to read one more of these girls chapters you know yeah. to, to write somebody who had to be more so passive in points where i would just want to take a baseball bat and start cracking people across the knees it's hard when you're aggressive it's hard to write somebody more passive so for me writing ruby was was more difficult but i mean what's what's writing without a challenge like if you're not challenging yourself then like you're really not right yeah absolutely <clears throat> i agree and that's what that that's what i hear um, well, in a way, when you were talking about how you didn't know and you sort of jumped in with with being like, okay, multiple POV, this and this and this, like, I, I don't even know. I'm just going to dive right in. But I think maybe maybe something that was churning also is like, that's what keeps you coming to the page, sort of a puzzle you're trying to figure out. And, you know, it doesn't get boring because you're being surprised constantly as you come back to the page. And then the reader can feel that. I'm going to talk about that um, in just a second. But um, I did want to ask you quickly, if you knew the ending when you started, um, like, did you have the whole outline? Did you know how it was going to end when you started writing the book or did, did that come to you through the process? Oh, no, it came to me through the process. And I'm going to tell you exactly what happened when I figured out the end of this book. <laughs> I almost like I, I, uh, I was in my bathroom when I was figuring out the, the ending to the book. But I was, you know, like the little scrapers uh, that you have, like for your, you know, for your teeth. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm like I'm super, like oral hygiene is really, really important to me. So I had like little <laughs> scrapers, like for my teeth, and I figured out the ending. But I hit my gum line, and oh. then I, yeah, and I had like a mouthful of blood, but I didn't give oh, a crap. Wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I, I I found a piece of paper and like wrote the ending, and then took care of that later. Like, I just was like, I just had to write the ending. And I'm just like, yep, I nicked the gum line. But uh, okay, okay. yeah, so I mean, that's the fun thing about pantsing. I used to think that, you know, authors, you know, when I read author interviews, they were, they were being kind of pretentious when they say like, oh, this character really surprised me when they, you know, when I wrote this. And I'm like, yeah, sure, they surprised you. Okay. Yeah. And like, it really surprised to the point where like, I almost lost part of my gum line. Cause yeah. I figured out like how I was gonna end this book. I was like, you know, and yeah. people don't people don't know. I don't as a writer, or maybe I'm just like super unique about it. But the bathroom is where I get like most of my ideas. Like I'm like brushing my teeth or doing something else. Okay. And I'm just like, oh my god! And I like have to like run to my room and like write whatever it is down. Like, and it's always a big plot hole that I can't figure out. You know, I just that the the bathroom saved me in more ways than one and it sounds really funky to say that both literally and figuratively but it doesn't make it any less true <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah the, i love i actually love hearing that mine is so your bathroom is my walking i'll go for a walk and that's how i figure things out and i was reading i i mean i love walking walking and i was reading a book about walking and it was actually talking about how i don't know the science behind it but something about how the movement there can really like get your brain you would maybe say things you wouldn't normally say or think things you know, wouldn't normally think because you get your body moving it's the endorphin yeah it's really fascinating it, it really is and I, I was reading a part specifically how it was saying that people tend like it was like this walking therapy and where if you walk with a therapist it was like people tend to open up a little bit more when they're not looking right at the person they can just like walk and they'll just start spilling all kinds of stuff out that they maybe wouldn't even say sitting so it's really fascinating so i like the idea of that and i know me whenever i have a problem in a book have a plot problem or a character issue if i go for a walk it really does that's how i figure it out so um with my novel whiskey and ribbons i, I it took me so long to figure out how i wanted to 
organize it, I couldn't figure it out. I just couldn't. So if I was sitting in a computer, it would never have happened. But I used to just walk. I would just go and walk three miles, walk three miles, walk three miles. And that's how I figured it out. So yeah. it's a little bit safer than almost killing yourself by stabbing yourself in the mouth. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, maybe I'll go for a walk. Because when I read Risky and Rivers, it just seemed so natural. So I didn't really think that there was kind of any struggle with the, the flow in terms of like the timeline. Because I was just like, well, I mean, I read it in like two days. So I'm going to just say that. <laughs> but um, yeah, that, that's so surprising. I feel like I have inside information now. Now I'm smug. Now I'm smug about it. <laughs> Did you know when Lisa was no, riding Risky and Ribbon? <laughs> no. Uh, was it was it the same on so we can glow? It was it the um, same on so we can glow? Um. Well, it, it was that was a totally different. It was a totally different. No, I didn't. No, no, <laughs> not at all. Because those stories, the stories in so we can glow, were written from 2010 until 20, uh, you know, 2018, and so it was just a longer period of time, and and that didn't it didn't take the same amount of effort in terms of you know plotting, of course, because I was dealing with 42 short stories but and stories, not one novel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I um, but yeah, th thank you, thanks for the compliment of saying that it reads easy because I I put it down for years, convinced that I couldn't finish it because I I couldn't figure out how to do it, so. But enough about me. This is about you, and I'm excited to talk to you about this. So, oh, okay, because um, I'm like, we can talk about whiskey and ribbon. I'm good with that. Let's <laughs> talk about it. Let's do this. No, so tell me. So my dad is a preacher. Who is a preacher? Your dad, your grandfather? My dad. My, my okay. dad. Um, both of my grandfathers, unfortunately, passed away. One, when my mom was, like, 12, her dad passed away. And then my, my dad's oh. dad passed away when I was, like, one. So it was literally okay. just, like, but him, my uncle, my godfather, they're all preachers raised in the church. Okay. 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 So yeah, my dad has been preaching since I was three. So it's kind of all that I know. Um, and, and then that's why I connected with this immediately, but specifically how does your, you know, having a dad who's a preacher and being a PK, how does that inform the way that you want to represent that in your work? Because I'm thinking, you know, we know that our dads are human. We know that our dads are not perfect. And, but a lot of people in the church, they tend to worship, but they want a family. We, they, exactly. But then also, you know, I, I'm not quite sure where you stand in your faith right now. I am a believer. I, you know, uh, me and my daddy have a really close relationship. And, and so I didn't feel, I didn't feel the weight of our, you know, okay. So my example is we would go to church and then I could also come home and watch Madonna and George Michael videos on MTV. And at church, they would tell us never watch George Michael videos. Yeah. And then I'd come home and my dad would turn on Madonna because he loves Madonna still to this day. So it was like, I would hear, I will I would be hear your father figure, <laughs> put your tiny hand in my, I will be your preacher. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You shouldn't have mentioned George Michael. No, that's my jam. That's my, that's my favorite George Michael song. But yeah. So then it was like, so then I, I, of course I heard in that, you know, not every church preaches that they go a little too far, but then my daddy wouldn't try to enforce that stuff in the house. Cause he felt like that's that sort of stuff was ridiculous. But like, did you feel this sort of like torn loyalty? You want to tell the truth about people and human nature, but then also to not ba you know, bash the church or bash a preacher or, you know, a congregation or, or anything like like that did you feel torn with that like how did that work for you okay so for me my dad I, my I, when I was born my dad wasn't a preacher like he was an usher then a deacon then you know he became like the pastor of his own church um he would try to do that like kind of you know oh you shouldn't watch the Simpson like yeah bro so I'm Bart Simpson who the hell are you uh-huh like I was already a nerd. I was already a nerd at church. I mean, excuse me, I was already a nerd at school. Now you want me to miss the Simpsons? Like, bro, I can't go, bro. And plus the thing is my mom was uh and and is just like she was just an advocate of just like, you know, they're kids, they're gonna do what they do. Um, my dad and I have a very loving relationship. It's complicated because mm -hmm. I see him as a man. And there are other people who put them up on the pedestal. Like, bro, I'll knock you down off that pedestal real quick. 
this is who you are. Recognize who you are. Right. Recognize I love you. Right. I'm not right. putting you on this pedestal like these other people. You better go to those other people for that. And my, like my whole kind of relationship with my dad at this point, and yes, I'm a believer too. I'm a Christian too. Um, mm-hmm. So I didn't feel like I had to choose between one thing or the other. I just choose truth and portraying people in a truthful way. So for me, there's no bashing the church or I'm, if, if somebody feels like that, well, that's their problem to have. They can't make their problem right. their problem. I wanted to portray people in a truthful way. And, you know, the church is run by human beings. Human beings make mistakes right. sometimes. Really huge, screwed up mistakes. It is what it is. And then what do you do about it, you know, at, at that juncture, at that point in time? Um, and I will also say that my mom was also a really big, you know, advocate of us listening to, you know, pretty much whatever music we wanted to within reason for our age range. So, like, we wasn't right, right. listening to NWA. Like, that was a two live crew. Right. Okay. Okay. Hello. Hello. <laughs> no we didn't do that we didn't we didn't get like that down we didn't get down like that in my house but like you would do George Michael yeah. and Madonna um I jokingly say this but like when I was around that age I had like the taste of like a 40 year old white woman so like there was like a lot of Rod Stewart <laughs> and Phil Collins oh I, I love said, no, oh no, my I love god oh, yeah. I love Phil Collins so much. Oh, I so yeah. Much. I mean, I literally made a Phil Collins song, their song, and Whiskey and Ribbons because I love Phil Collins so much. Thank you. Yeah, okay, absolutely. I, and so, everyone okay. should love Phil Collins. Like, I mean, there there not, shouldn't be any debate there. Yeah. There really shouldn't. I mean, like, please. And I mean, then he did like the whole like Tarzan soundtrack for Disney. I it went so that. hard. It, it went it, too hard. I, I, he didn't I, have I, to go that hard. I, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it so much. I don't care. I love it. Um, <laughs> So, you know, so like there was, um, there was like a lot of freedom in my house, but I think it was more so because of my mom. If it wasn't for her being kind of that buffer, my dad would have tried to kind of give in a little bit more, I think, to that. Don't listen to circular music. Don't, you know. And, yeah. and my mom was just like, nah, son, we're not doing this in this house. And my mom is the one who wears the pants. So my dad would be like, okay. Oh, wow. You know. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like um, my, the Potter family is based in part on my family, but Joanna's a little bit more passive than my mama is. Like my mama would just be like, sweet. The part that Joanna was really, really reminded me of my mom was kind of at the end um, when she was just telling, you know, Jackson, like, just bring my baby home or don't bother coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was my mom. My mom is a lot more, you know, uh, uh, aggressive than Joanna was, but um, on the on the whole, um, like I said, I don't, I didn't feel a, a pull one way or the other. My whole thing was, I'm just going to tell the truth as I see it in a fictional book, and you like it, great. If you don't, that's going to be your problem and not mine. That's it. Yeah. No, I love that you say that. And if you really read the Bible, you know, and not just say you read it, but actually read it, you see that that's what the Bible is full of, actual real people who are not perfect in any way who screw up constantly and that's the thing like who are screwing up constantly and are still being redeemed and so you know I, I think that's the beauty of it and you're taught so you know when I wrote down that question I was thinking about Reverend Potter I was thinking about Lebanon these men that you've written these complicated men with these dark pasts and with these, you know, they're not perfect by any means. And some people might be like, they're sort of awful. And then they have, you know, but that they're real, they're real people. And then on the other side, what I wanted to talk about as we begin to wrap up was specifically about the women. And I wanted to, uh, the, I wanted to bring that up because of this whole idea of like black girl magic, which we all kind of get behind and we love. But then the reality of that is that black girls are not magical. We are not, we don't have some kind of super human strength, meaning that we don't need love and care and tenderness. And did you feel, and so I, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that that comes as a black woman that comes naturally to you, but did you feel like you went, did you go back at all and adjust either like their strength or tenderness? Like th- did that come easily for you? Because they're so well-rounded and you know, of course they have black girl magic too, but they're also dealing with real issues and they love each other. Like I just love their relationship so much. But like, was that something that 
you wrote as a wish for your own life or you have that, like you were bank, you know, you were bringing your experiences into that. So talk to me about the black women in the book and their relationships and stuff. I love how you said was, was that a wish for me at that point? Yeah, it was. Cause, mm-hmm. um, the majority of my friendships are, are with men, right? Yeah. So, um, it was very much one of those things where this is what I wish I had as, as an, uh, as a young adult and as an adult woman, cause I didn't, you know, I, I literally like, I would just kind of joke and say, my mom is my only girlfriend. Because at that point, is mm-hmm. that what it was? Um, now that I'm older, I, I think that there was just like back in elementary school, like kids can be cruel, girls especially can be brutal, and I think I really just would carry that. I carried that, you know, within me, kind of like throughout elementary school, high school, and even college. So like I wasn't messing around with too many females if if I had to. So when I was writing about Black women, it was literally just like this wish for what I wanted Mm -hmm. from a relationship when I was Layla's age, um, when I was a little younger than that, when, um, you know, now that that I'm an an older woman, like, this is what I I want. This is what I would have wanted. And then it was also good for me to just really look at the females around me, so in my family. So the reason they're so well-rounded because they're based on so many women that I knew in terms of my family members, women at church. I mean, there is nothing, you know, nothing stronger than like a 75-year-old Black woman in the church. I dare you to find someone stronger <laughs> than a 75-year-old church. I, I don't think that it exists. Um, at least it doesn't in my realm. So it, it was just like wonderful to kind of use like the different characteristics of these women to kind of, you know, as you say, bring kind of a more well-rounded magic. And I also wanted to highlight Black female friendships and what they are capable of when we bond together. We're not like nitpicky tearing each other, tearing each other down. Like when we really, really go to bat with one another, it's like, Mm -hmm. Lisa, you could kill somebody. And I look at the officer and be like, yo, bro, she was with me the whole night. Oh yeah, I know you might have her on tape. That don't look like her though. (laughs) That don't look like her. I don't know. I don't know. She, her glasses is different. Her glasses are shaped different, officer. Her glasses are shaped different, sir. You know what I mean? That's what I want to encapsulate, like the power of Black female friendships. And, um, and I hope Save Ruby King did that justice. Yeah, no, absolutely it did. And it, it, as I lead to my last question, that's what I, that's what I would really you know, we talked about all this diversity and in, in publishing that, you know, of course, came to a head back in, you know, June, but needs to be a constant conversation when we talk about that. But this book specifically, I think, would be such a great book. And I'm sure book clubs are doing it for women, black women, white women, Latinx women, like just, when, you know, I mean, just women a- across the board and people just in general. But but I really feel like, you know, that that so often as black writers, it's sort of, I don't want to say it's assumed, but, you know, it just gets to feel sort of gross if people feel like Black writers can't write about things that are universal. That, you know, we write about love, it's just this Black love. How could you understand? Or when we write about that, you know, parenting, it's like, oh, Black parenting. But it's these universal things that if you just open your mind a little bit, because, you know, I grew up just reading books by white people for a certain amount of time, you know what I mean? Because that's what they had. And that's what I saw. And I could identify with some of the stuff in there, you know, and, and the same way they can identify with some of the stuff whatever but it's like you know I'm glad it became a larger conversation but I didn't want it just to be a, a you know like a just a flashy topic for June like this is something we need to talk about and for black people to get their books published especially if they're not just only focused on race all the time it's still hard I mean it's yeah, still exactly. hard to do that and yeah I think that the the problem is that like growing up we were forced to and get, you know, and, and engage the white gays. Like we had right. no choice because it was just all around us. It was in books, it was in movies, it was in television. We had no choice, okay? You know, everybody knows friends, but only we know about living single, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, it's kind of one of those things, like they know about Saturday Night Live, but we know about in living color. <laughs> You know what I mean? So it's just like, we have to, but, but we have to know about both things, right? They right. don't have to. So right. then, you know, my whole thing is, you know what? 
just come over to this side, okay? You <laughs> have to engage the white gaze for so much. You can enjoy the black gaze, okay? You need to yeah. come to our level. You need to come up to our level. And I shouldn't have to like pander and explain things to you, for, you know, the white gaze. I don't need to give, right. you know what I mean? I don't need to make Layla the sidekick. And have like, you, right, know, right. you know, like have Layla have a white friend and she's like the sassy sidekick. I'm like, no, I shouldn't have to right. do that. I should be able to have a book with a bunch of black characters and you be happy about it and figure out what the words to Diddy mean. This is not my problem. <laughs> I don't need to, I'm not explaining this. You know what I mean? And yeah. like you said, it, this can't, like you said, just be, as you said, like a flashy conversation point. This needs to result in sustainable change, especially when it yeah. comes to, you know, the books that are published, what Black authors are paid. Like, this needs to change. You know what I mean? We need to have people in every single level, like people in, in publishing and marketing and sales and, right. you know, Black editors. You know what I mean? It's just like to find a Black editor who deals with adult fiction. I don't think there's like a couple of them. And I really right, stuck right. out with Laura Brown because she is a true ally and, and really understood what I was trying to do. She knew what the ditty meant. There was no, there was, you know <laughs> what I mean? Like she was, I knew Laura Brown and I was going to get along with, she was just like, have you read this book by this black author? Have you read this book? And I'm like, sitting up here like, ooh, ooh, yeah, body yeah. shot, body <laughs> shot. <laughs> like I had read a couple of them, but not all of them. And I'm like, ooh, she told me, okay. Yeah. No, so it, it was it, it it was and it is a pleasure to 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 work with uh, with Laura. She's just chef's kiss, like it is to work with with my agent. But it's it's just you you don't have many of us in this industry. So when you can find an ally, you you stick with them as much as you can. But then you work with them to help initiate yeah. the change we need to see from the top down and from the bottom up. Yeah. No, agree with you on that. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and, to, and, you know, the, the fact that we're here talking about it and we've written our books and we will keep writing books, Lord willing, is also just an important part of the process too. just to be able to write, you know, like Miss Morrison said, to be, if you, there's a book you don't see, you have to write it. Right. And that's what, you know, yeah. that's what really compelled me. That's what really inspired me to write my own stories. Yeah. Me, uh, yeah. And so to that so end, good. what are you, <laughs> Yeah. So my last question to that end, what are you working on now that you can talk about? Can you talk about anything? Well, I'm going to talk about it regardless because it's you, Lisa. It's you, baby. <laughs> hey, let me talk to you. Come here. Let me talk to you. <laughs> so uh, right now I am working on uh, a prequel to Saving Ruby King. So, oh, wow. Uh, mm -hmm, and it's basically about Sarah and her years in Memphis. I love mm -hmm. that. What a treat. That's such a treat to hear. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome then. Good, good. How's that going? Uh, it's going uh, pretty doggone well. Okay. You know, <laughs> pray, pray, prayerfully it gets picked up and, and you know, uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see with that. Um, but the, uh, the outline, I actually, I had to write an outline this time. And I had never written a book outline, so okay. that was interesting. Yeah. Um, and I fell in love with it even more. Like I gained a lot more confidence writing the book outline because I could kind of see the story taking right, shape right. and kind of figuring out what's going to happen. And but then also knowing like I'm not married to to every single, you know, I'm not married to any of these points. It's just right, kind right. of a nice way to kind of shape the the outer portion of like the shell of the story but I'm really excited uh I've, you know written a few chapters and and you know I'm kind of getting my you know I'm getting my little groove that's awesome yeah no and I'm that's it. awesome well I yeah. can't wait yeah I mean you know awesome. prayerfully you you love it just as much if not more uh than, than Saving Ruby King but it Saving Ruby yeah, King will well, probably end up being a little bit of a series but let's uh let's let's awesome. we'll, we'll just see We'll see where it takes us. I love it. Good luck with that. And yeah, and Teresa, if you do have, um, if, if there are some questions, I'm not sure if you could let us know about those right now. Sure. There's just one comment. Um, it's about, I think, really important part of the book and would love to be able to read it 
tips from Kate. Um, thank you so much for capturing the conflict one feels when they know a friend or relative is being abused, but the individual being abused doesn't want them to tell anyone, just to listen. We think that we would do anything to protect ourselves and those we love, but when it comes to turning someone into the police or having everyone know about the abuse, it becomes much, much more complicated than anticipated. You did an amazing job of capturing that frustration. Thank you. I love this novel and encourage book clubs everywhere to read and discuss it. Thank you so much, Kate. I appreciate it. That means a lot. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, wow. I remember I really have to agree with that. And that's one thing, you know, we didn't actually touch on that because obviously Kathy and I can talk all night, but but yeah, that that way that was handled, I think was really true. And and that comment there just actually, you know, brought tears to my eyes. That was really that's really, really important part of this too. And the family that you've created in these friendships and in these relationships that you've shown all, you know, so much uh, and when it comes to the whole quilt that is made within a church within relationships, within a city. Um, you have just done a brilliant job and congratulations on all that. It was really my pleasure to talk to you tonight. Lisa, I can't thank you enough. Uh, once again, you're just a fantastic writer. You're somebody I look up to, like I said, whiskey and ribbons, I threw it across the room. I said, I'm not gonna do, I can't do it. Can't do it. <laughs> and so we can glow, I've read, so we can glow at least two or three times. I already told you my favorite stories. And Lisa, I just, I can't wait for your, I can't wait for your book. Uh, pre-order the pre-order. You hear me? It's, it's going to be wonderful. <laughs> and I just, it's just so awesome. And, and thank you so much. I really look up to you. Thank you. And thank you, Teresa and Jordan and City Lit Books. Thank you so much for hosting us. Jordan, Teresa, one, one, one. Thank y'all so it's much. Great. I really appreciate it. What a great conversation. Um, everyone, make sure you get both of these books. They're wonderful. Well, thank you for the wonderful conversation. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, everybody. Thank Good you. Bye. 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 Bye.